Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast, where we discuss all sorts of things Germanic heathenry related. My name is Jesse. I am your host. Let's get into it. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to this week's episode of the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in today and watching this episode. As always, if you enjoy what I do here on whatever platform that you're catching this, uh, please be sure to engage with the platform in some way to show your appreciation. Give the video a like, follow this podcast on your preference or on your platform of, of choice, on your preferred platform, I guess. Um Share it around. If you have the ability to comment, please do. Um, if the podcast asks you to answer a question, maybe a poll, you know, do all those things. It really helps uh, with the growth of, of the podcast, and I, I really appreciate it. So um, do be sure also to check the link tree link in the description and show notes of this episode, as in all others, for all of the other ways that you can support uh, Midgard Musings and the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast. Follow me on all my socials if you want to buy merchandise, if you want to become a patron on Patreon, if you want to do any other sort of thing that uh, I have available uh, to support me monetarily, uh, check it out and see what fits you. Um, as Also, as a reminder, um, I will be making some Elder Futhark rune sets here soon. Um, I've actually, by the time this airs, I've already uh, should have started uh, the, 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 the crafting process. Um, on a number of rune sets. I don't know yet how many I'm going to make, um, but I'm going to be making quite a few. Um, and <clears throat> I'm going to be making them to help fund a, a trip that my tribe and I are going on. It's going to be a collective tribe, and I'd like to, to do something to help contribute uh, financially. So you can help in that uh, venture as well by purchasing rune sets. Um, all of the proceeds of, of those sales, minus the shipping costs to get them sent to you, um, all of the rest of that is going to go towards the tribe's um, funds. So be on the lookout for that. I will be sharing that on my social media platforms, Facebook, uh, in, uh, Twitter, and Instagram, um, as well as YouTube. Um, so wherever you're following me on, hopefully you'll see it. And if you want a rune set um, now or in the future, you know you can always email me or, or hit me up on any of those socials. So you'll notice something a little bit, uh, <clears throat> a little bit different about my uh, my ensemble today I'm, I'm wearing this 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 faux fur <laughs> i wish it was real um but it's a faux fur like shoulder piece um which if you've been following midgard musings for uh any length of time you might remember that this thing was the old you know ensemble that i would wear on screen um, to do all of my videos in, or at least a lot of my videos. The look has changed over the years. You know, we've, we've come a long way in um, in the setup and in the production of this channel and, and now on this, of this podcast. Um, but I haven't donned the, the, the fur <laughs> in, in quite some time, except for maybe like, you know, ritual purposes and things like that. Um, again, it's not, it's, it's supposed to be a replica of bear fur. Um, definitely not real. I don't have the ability to purchase bear fur. Uh, or the funds to purchase bear fur. But the reason I'm wearing this today is because a longtime viewer, a very good friend of mine, Patrick Walsh, he, uh, he's he been on this show several times, more than just several times. He's been to my house. Um, we've become very good friends over the years. And and one of the videos that he always comes back to me on saying how much it's, it's helped him is a video that's going to be, you'll see it right here, right? Um, if you want to watch the original version of this video, uh, it's going to be linked down in the description area or in the show notes of this podcast as well. Um, but for, you know, for a warning, right, fair, fair, fair warning, I guess you could say, the uh, the quality is definitely not as good. The The background music is a bit overwhelming. There's a lot of echo. You know, I was in a, a fairly empty room and I didn't have a good enough microphone at the time to to really isolate my my audio. Um, so. It is what it is, um, but it's the video for how to perform a basic heathen ritual. And Patrick recently hit me up and said that he would love for me to do a video just like this one. And he pointed to the 
to the to the one that at this point in time um is, is probably the, the the video on my channel that has the highest views i think the last time i checked it was um over eight thousand views on this channel um so it's definitely got some traction over the years and it's it's one of the more popular ones um so we'll see how good this one does maybe we'll get close to that um but i'm going to be redoing this this video um mainly out of patrick's request or, you know from patrick's request he wanted a video like that and in that video i'm wearing this i had a different shirt on at the time of course my my background was different i'm not gonna undo my whole setup just to look like it was back in the day um this is as close as i got i got the the hair down i got the shawl on um so that's what we're doing today we're we're, we're, we're going back to some of the og content style uh here on this channel and on, on, on midgard music so for those of you listening uh do be sure to check that video out so you can kind of get a reference point and see matter of fact that video as i recall was I wasn't even at 2,000 subscribers yet, um, and, and we're over 5,000 here today. Um, so anyway, how to perform a basic heathen ritual. You know, back at the time when I when I released that video, um, I not a lot has really changed in, in the sense of um, my views on things, but I'm hopefully going to be able to present it to you better and offer some clarification on some things um, and give you a much more streamlined process i think this is a topic that for folks coming into heathenry um may have may have curiosities and questions about like how do i do this thing that or the other and it's good to have a basic foundation it's good to have the fundamental framework for you to work off of okay um so as i like to say right um i'm not here to tell you how to be heathen I'm not here to tell anyone how to be heathen. There are certain things about heathenry um, and, if, and its orthopraxic nature that almost demand a very specific way of doing things. Um, and, and there are times, I think, where, where that does have its place. You know, like you, it's, it, if it's not, if you're not doing it that way, then don't call it that thing, you know. So um, we are going to keep that in mind as we move into this episode. Um, but in keeping that in mind, I want you to know that, again, I'm not telling you how to do things. What I'm doing is giving you a framework to build off of. So what I'm going to be sharing with you today is a really, I think, well-structured format to follow when it comes to performing ritual, whether it's a solitary ritual. OK, if you're a if you're a kind of a solitary practitioner, you don't have a, a kindred or a tribe or anything like that, a group that you're necessarily affiliated with. Um, but you want to have something of a structured order to your hearth cult again this type of thing that i'm going to be sharing with you today will help with that and the framework will also help with um doing a a larger scale ritual okay you can kind of follow this methodology or, or, or use this framework i think pretty effectively and pretty well if you are in a group setting with multiple people um and you want to carry out a ritual um, in, in the best way possible. So one of the things that um, I, I covered in the original video were the items that you would will basically need, you know. Um, and I mentioned things like a bloat bowl, a bowl that is specifically used for bloat. This is a very important thing. All right. Any of your ritual items, um, when it comes to your whether it's your individual cultic practice, your hearth cult, right? Or if it is the thing that is used as a group's, you know, the group's items, the tribe's relics, the tribe's items, things that belong to the tribe as a whole. Um, these things need to be kept separate from any other use, you know, so you wouldn't be going into your kitchen cabinet and grabbing a cereal bowl um, to perform bloat or, or to give bloat or to do anything ritually speaking. You would want to have an, these items separate and kept exclusively for your ritual purposes bloat bowl right so the bowl that contains the bloat offering we're going to get into bloat and, and and what i mean by that here in just a minute but i think for anybody that's been on the channel here or watched my content and, and listen to the podcast for any length of time you ought to know by now um but if you're new here I'll, I'll i'll just tell you you know bloat is the the blood offering okay um does it always have to be blood your offerings can can be things other than blood, but um, just 
again, kind of realize when it comes to heathen practices, if we're talking bloat, uh, bloat requires blood. Yeah, the, the, the blood of the animal that was sacrificed um, and that is used for the feast. Um, and the blood is the gift, the sacrifice to the gods. Um, so anyway, your bowl, the thing that contains the liquid. All right. So if you're uh, not doing bloat, if you're not giving blood, then you could use your bloat bowl for a libation. You know, so if it's uh, ale or mead or uh, cider, even whatever, um, these are all perfectly acceptable um, uh, items to use for the bloat part of your ceremony, the bloat part of your ritual. Um, and I'm using bloat in the terms of the the the, the verb <laughs> sense, right? So the 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 to, to bloat to give bloat to sacrifice, right? The, the the thing that's in it in the in your bloat bowl. Um, if it's not blood, if it's not actual blood then we'll, we'll, we'll call it a bloat bowl for the sake of the video and, and for your sakes. Um, but whatever it contains, it, whatever liquid that you're using should be something of value, of worth, right? Um, something that you put energy into, whether it's, you know, making it yourself, um, harvesting it yourself, purchasing it yourself. I mean, you know, something of value. So bloat bowl, one very important thing. Another important thing for the ceremony would be a hout tame. Now you're going to see here on the screen um, a couple examples of things that you might that 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 that, that I have had on altars for our tribal affairs over the years. You're going to see a bowl. You're going to see the hautain, which is the sprig of an evergreen tree, right? So the branches of like a cedar or or a fir tree or a pine tree um, or something. Um, I know probably some folks that are watching or listening may not be in areas where those coniferous type trees are indigenous and may not grow. Um, so you would you would seek to use something that is uh, indigenous to your area, you know? So if you don't have pine trees or cedars or junipers or any such thing like that, no fir trees, um, what is the thing that that is indigenous to your area? And you can replace that with, um, you, know, you, can, you can replace the pine tree stuff with whatever grows local. And we call it the hout tame. This is the thing that is used to sprinkle the blood or the ale or the cider or whatever you have in your bloat bowl. Um, this is the item that is used to sprinkle and bless either the attendees, yourself, maybe the items of your altar. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, again, it's, it's used as a blessing instrument. Um, you might also have items like God poles, statues, um, physical representations of the divine to adorn the sacred space. It could be if you have an outdoor altar called a herger, um, which is like a pile of stones used to leave your offerings and stuff at, um, you might have an actual like pole erected outside. You know, some some uh, Saxon heathens will have like an irmansul, um, or they'll have a, a taller god pole that they've carved or, or, or standing or something of a, of a larger nature in there sacred space that that, that herger the, that outdoor altar um, but if you're indoors and you have a smaller area or you, or you know you're looking to adorn maybe a small mantle or a table you know anything that is a physical representation of the gods is is fine we've handcrafted something even better um, or if you have access to people who do craft these things i know there's plenty of that going on in the heathen and pagan community so they're not hard to find uh craftsmen and women craftspeople who who make these these uh, these these idols, if you want to call them that, these statues. So you'll want to have that. You'll want to have your bloat bowl. You want to have your float your float tang, and you'll want to have the the gift. You know the thing that you are looking to give as a gift. Of course, the bowl is going to be the receptacle of the gift to the god. So you might have a bottle of mead, or or a bottle of ale or cider. Um, um, or the bowl itself might contain the blood of an animal that you've um, sacrificed. And when I say sacrificed, I mean ethically and humanely raised and um, slaughtered in, in, in the fashion of what we would do if we had, were like farmers. Um, so any of that such things, like those are, the, those are the critical items. Those are the fundamental items that you would have. And then there are other things that you can think of adorning your altar with. If it's a, if it's a a ritual that you're performing to a specific deity, right? You might have more accoutrements and effects that favor 
um, that deity that you're trying to uh, to gift to, right? Um, you might have, if it's like an ancestral thing and you're, and you're doing it to your ancestors, you might have photos or pictures of your ancestors, right? I'm talking specifically now um, of just the basic fundamentals. All of the other stuff that you would put on your and on your on your space on the altar um can be again it's it, this is just a framework right so customize it and, and make it make it your own so let me know what those things are that we would want to have um during the ritual now we would want to start trying to determine the steps of performing the ritual so i'm going to start kind of give you a step-by-step -step breakdown of what you need to do so starting first with the creation of sacred space. I mentioned stuff about this recently in another podcast, which is going to be linked down in the description and also the show notes of this episode about, um, you know, uh, creating sacred space or, or having sacred space in individual cultic practice, the hearth cult, right? We, we talked about setting up our altars or or you setting up an altar or having an altar place, uh, a place set up in your house for an altar. Um, but the ultimate point that we're talking about here right now is we have to create sacred space for the purpose of the ritual. How is that done? Um, very commonly, the way sacred space is set is through the use of fire. There are examples of this throughout different sources. There is one particular saga, which I will mention down in the description. Uh, that talks about this man who took who takes up fire um uh to but before he performs a uh, a ritual there's also mention in the lanama book um, so the icelandic book of of settlers right when when iceland became settled um there's this book called lanama book and in that book also mentions um the use of fire when walking about a perimeter or walking the outside area of a land to create boundaries and to set the, the separate the, the 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 sacred from the profane right so fire is a very effective and traditional method of uh creating sacred space now of course if you're outside you have a bit you know depending on where you live you might have a bit more freedom to have bigger fire you know you might be able to have a campfire bonfire out there with this actual stick um that you turn into a torch and, and you walk your Perimeters, you know, this it's not the same as like calling the corners that we see in like Wiccan um, ceremonies of, of creating a sacred space. But I guess the nuance kind of echoes things. You know, there are nuances to it. So it's not exactly the same. Um, but if you're indoors, and of course, it's, you know, not feasible or, or practical or safe to carry a torch around in your house. A candle is fine. Um, even an incense stick because it is burning and it has fire in it. Um, so a bowl of resin that's burning, right? Anything that's a representative representation of fire is, is fine. And I think most places, um, every place that I've ever lived, you, you know, including apartments, you can have candles, right? So you can burn a small candle and, and be fine with that. Just be smart, be safe. Um, but fire is probably the best way for, uh, the creation of sacred space. All right. Are there other ways that you can do it? Sure, I, I suppose, you know, um, you can have, uh, you know, uh, minerals or, 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 or uh, water that's been blessed with herbs and things like that. You know, if, you, if you're a bit more of a, <clears throat> again, a kind of favor the Wiccan side of things, um, there's that pro process. But I'm talking specifically now about heathen practice, right? So fire is, is the way that that we're going to do it next thing we want to do is give a prayer or in this case a bead which is an old english word for prayer to the gods goddesses ancestors whatever of your choice that you're performing this ritual for now what does that prayer have to to sound like or, or what is the framework of that really um it, it can be as much or as 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 little as you want it can be a simple hailing of a god, you know, um, giving maybe some of their their by names or kennings, you know. So, um, for instance, if you know you're you're giving a I don't know giving a bloat to Thor or or, or giving a ritual, um, and and your your main focus is on Thor, you know, you might open 
with a prayer to Thor, you know, and call him by his many names, you know, hail to hail to you, Thor, um, thunderer, uh, chariot rider, you know, um, red beard, um, protector of Midgard, slayer of giants, you know, uh, Krungnir's bane. I mean, you can come up with so many different things by learning more about the gods and really getting to know about them, or if it's a local spirit, maybe. Um, or if it's an ancestor, you know, it's it's a, basically an invocation of that figure um, who you're trying to involve in this ritual um, and welcoming them and asking for their blessing. You know, and in many cases, it might be, you know, hail and welcome Thor, you know, friend of, of mankind, protector of Midgard, of, of gods and man, you know, hail to you, Thunderer. We ask that your blessing of, of protection and, and fertility be upon us or something, right? I mean, again, you can become as poetic, you can become as um, fancy with it as you want, right? It, it should just, it should be heartfelt and it should be what comes from your heart, you know? So what a lot of folks might do is, is take time to write a ritual out, write a prayer out. They might even do it in a language that is not regularly spoken here in modern times. So they might write a prayer in Old Norse or in, in, in Old Saxon or Old English or, or some other Germanic language, perhaps, um, again, to, to, to connect better with the, the figures, the deities, the, the, the divine, the sacred, the gods, um, the spirits, your ancestors, whatever, um, you know, speaking to them in, in their native language kind of thing, building that connection in that sort of way. Um, so you want to give a prayer um, and then the bloating takes place, you know, um, this can, again, just be as simple as, um, giving some sort of acknowledgement to the higher power or powers that you're, um, working with in your ritual, um, and, and claiming clearly, you know, that this, this gift of mead, this gift of ale, this gift of blood, whatever, you know, we give to you now, um, in, in hopes of a gift in return. Is, 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 a, is a very common, like I know, you know the gifting cycle is, is of course a, a recurring theme and, and, is a, and is a very important aspect of heathenry, you know, so the, the gift always seeks a gift. And I've seen that, uh, you know, being used in, in ritual before, you know, acknowledging that this is a gift in hopes of get, receiving a gift in return from you of this thing, that or the other. And the bloating involves the blessing or the sending of that gift to the sacred. So outdoors um this can be really easy to do because the gift again is of liquid so whether it's blood or whether it's alcohol um it is consumed by the land it is it is um usually poured out um after the after the if it's like a group ceremony sort of thing after the attendees are blessed with the thotain um or maybe you bless yourself or maybe you bless your altar with the god poles and everything that you have on it you know then the disposal of it um goes usually to like the the wherever the sacred space is that you're holding it right so it might go to your herger if you're outside um it might go uh to a tree a nearby tree um just again kind of however your, your setup is um so you go through that process and that can be again as elaborate or as simple as you want it to be if you really want to make a big to do about it you want to write along um uh, like dissertation, a big long prayer, a big long something that you want to speak on during your ceremony. Um, it could just be off the cuff, you know, very heartfelt, nothing formal, you know, it's sort of an informal sort of delivery to it. Um, but all of that is part of the, the gifting process, you know, um, the gifts that are spoken are the gifts that are often received. And when we give those gifts from our heart and with the, the the, the, the power behind it, the power of our speech behind it, really sends it to where we want it to go. Um, so then it goes into uh, the presentation of the blood. You know where the blood goes, or the, where the where the offering goes. I'm, I'm saying blood because I'm thinking bloat in the sense of having blood. You know, so again, the bloat it's, is is part of the ceremony. The blood is the bloat, and your going to be sprinkling either yourself or, or your items or your attend or the attendees that are there with you if it's a group thing with this liquid right um and then disposing of it at your altar 
Um, once you've done all of that, once you've concluded the the act of gifting um, and, and bloating, you'll quite oftentimes want to close it out. You know, thank you to Thor. Thank you for uh, witnessing um, witnessing your people gathering together, witnessing me come to you today and in, in offering of this gift. Um, thank you for accepting this gift and um, you know, ever ride hard against the, the Yotes and, and, and whatever you want to say, right? Like, again, you can become very poetic with it. You can, you can make it your own, um, uh, but there's a closing prayer, you know, so you welcome them, you invoke them. And then at the close of things, we want to bid them farewell, right? And, and return them to where they came from, right? So thank you for coming um on your journeys back to where you are you know may your journeys be safe and, um, you know however you want to kind of send them off um you would you would give a closing prayer thanking them for being there um and wishing them well in their journey so that kind of there there's some other things you know um of course if it's a group setting um you have more people present, you know, quite oftentimes you might have a meal that is uh, a part of the whole thing. And so after the ritual, like, I'll just say like, uh, for our tribe, um, our, our main holy tides are our feasts, right? So we always feast, um, during the celebration of those holy tides and we'll always perform ritual first, right? We'll always get into that headspace clear of, of excess food or drink. Um, perform our, our ceremony, our ritual, and then we'll go eat. Um, in many cases, um, especially in ancient times, the meal, the feast, uh, what, again, that was killed for the, for the ceremony. The blood of that animal was used in the ceremony. Maybe you don't have that kind of thing going on. Not a lot of people do. Um, so you have a meal instead prepared for after the ceremony, after you've been doing what you've done, or been doing with the gods and, and the divine, you come in and you finish your meal. Maybe you have a sumble. Um, you know, so again, that, that doesn't really, I think, cover the, the how to perform a basic, you know, heathen ritual. But this here, um, I hope at least gives you, like, again, the basic framework of how to perform a basic heathen ritual. You want to have certain items. You want to have a all of your items for ritual, as again as a recap, all of your items that you use in ritual should be kept separate from everything else. All right. So your bloat bowl should be just for bloat. If you have any other sort of ceremonial pieces, um, blades, you know, anything like that, they should not be used for anything other than that purpose for the ceremony, you know. Once you've got the, the basic items, you again want to create sacred space wherever you are. Um, if it's your house, if it's outdoors, um, set those boundaries, create that space. Fire is the tried and true method. Um, again, if you look in the description and show notes, you'll see some references to that in historical source material that we uh, can glean from and, and use and, and, and practically apply here in modern times, right? Fire is readily available um, and it's and it's acceptable in, in almost every circumstance. So you create your sacred space, you open up with a prayer, you give the bloat, um, present it as the gift to the sacred space, right? Whether it's the altar, um, if you have to dispose of it, it should be disposed of ethically, humanely, not going to do anything that's going to harm the ground or harm the earth, which again, in most cases, blood and alcohol are 100% biodegradable. So pouring it into the earth is not going to hurt anything or anyone. Um, and then you uh, close out the ceremony with a prayer and go on your merry way. It doesn't have to be this great big, long, you know, and that's one of the things I think that some newer heathens especially get into. It's like I've got to do I got to make this big overture of a of a of a gesture, you know, to to the gods and, and, and stuff in order for it to be noticed. 
And while I think there is, you know, it, it's important to be serious, you know, and not just be like, well, you know, here, let me toss this thing on the ground and say, hail Odin and be on my mare and that's my bloat. Like, no, like approach it with the piety and, and, and appropriate degree of um, respect that it deserves, you know. Um, but it isn't like, you know, I hate to use this comparison, but it ain't like Catholic mass to that degree all the time. You know what I mean? And if anybody here is a, is a, is a Catholic, don't, don't misconstrue what I'm saying is bashing you. I think that Catholic mass is a, is a beautiful ritual experience, you know? Um, but it is very arduous and it's very methodical and there's a lot of things going on. Um, and, and your ceremonies and your rituals to the gods or to your ancestors or to the local spirits of the land that you reside near and around, um, they don't have to be this hour long thing. You know what I mean? With a little bit of thought and with some planning and with a good heart behind it, um, I think you'll have a great experience, you know. And the great thing of it, too, is that if you perform a ritual, let's say today, based off of what I'm saying to you, or you perform a ritual this weekend because of information that you're hearing from me today, and you find some things along the way that you want to incorporate that are meaningful and valuable in your cultic practice, in your heart cult, and you want to, again, blend that in, that's perfectly fine. Go for it. Make it your own. This is, again, really kind of focused more on the solitary practitioner, the individual, you know, uh, kind of solitary ritual uh, thing. Once again, this the framework can can be applied to a larger scale in group settings. But I think when it comes to your hearth cult, when it comes to your individual cultic practices, anything else that gets added is it's, it's your call, man. Your call, your call, you know? Um, I've, I've, you know, some rituals, uh, that I've gone to, you know, the runes get drawn, runes get pulled. Um, uh, yeah, just, you know, it's, it's, it's different strokes, different folks. And so if the group collective, the tribe, the kindred, whatever, uh, if their custom is that we're going to, you know, cast lots and we're going to pull runes. Or if it's something else, you know, um, whatever the methodology of that that group is, and that's their custom. And maybe you've been a part of a of a heathen ritual yourself that um, you've taken those things that you witnessed that you were a part of, and you've applied it into your hearth cult. Maybe you've taken some of those things and you've tailored it to your to your ways. Um, with 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 uh, you know, bearing one thing in mind, of course, is, is that, you know, in some cultures and some practices, not necessarily heathen, Germanic heathen, but in some practices, there are things that if you are a part of it, if you are invited to it, um, it is very sacred and it is not to be replicated, appropriated or reshared in any way, shape or form without express consent of the people who performed it. You know, if it's like a closed off ceremony, um, you shouldn't be going around blabbing about it, telling people about how it was done. Um, and if, if it spoke to you in such a profound way that you want to apply those things to your practices, you should talk to the people who, who, uh, who executed it with you and first, you know what I mean? Like if it's their tradition, if it's their way, if it's something that is proprietary to them, if it's a, if it's a custom that is theirs and, it, and, they, and you were blessed enough to, you know, been, been given the opportunity to share in that experience then before you appropriate it into your hearth cult or any other sort of ritual context always always make sure that you speak to those people who um is responsible for keeping those traditions and safeguarding those things make sure that you're not doing anything that is is uh against what they would want or their wishes but definitely make it your own you know um and again maybe you know, you've been doing things for a certain way for a long time and you're coming across this video or this, this, this episode. And some of the things that I'm saying to you now strike a, strike a nerve, you know, you're going, man, you know, there's this been, there's been this thing about the way I do things that just, 
feels a little bit off or I just I feel like I'm missing a certain element. And oh, what he just said there, that's that sounds like it could be it, you know, and so maybe you change your ways of doing things. I can't tell you how many times the rituals that I've either been in or performed while ha while they all have like kind of a very similar framework around them. There is not one ritual that I've ever been a part of is the same ritual twice in a row. You know what I mean? Like it's not a repeat of the same mass. It's not a repeat of the same service. It's not a repeat of the same thing. Exactly. 100%. There are elements about it that are of course uh, revisited and, and that you have recollection of, of, yep. I remember how this goes, but there are other parts of it that become what it's supposed to be for the moment. And I think some of that has to do with the more we learn. And as we grow, you know, we discover things, we, we find things, we want to incorporate things. That's how traditions live on. You know what I mean? Like, you know, when, when a tribe is, is first forming when, when a tribe is, is, is being established, a kindred group, whatever we want to call it. Right. When those things are being established, there's a lot of learning. You know, you don't just come into it quite oftentimes, especially if you're building it from the ground up with a really solid sense of this is how it's going to be 100 percent all the time. You're going to try things out. You're going to experiment. You're going to um, test those waters and see, right? Do we want to do it the way that this group does it? Do we want to do it the way that group does it? Do we want to do it a little bit of both? You know, or are we just going to make up something off the cuff our own way? And it's going to be ours 100%, you know, and, and if there's similarities, then it's coincidence and it's nothing that happened due to us being influenced by by an outside, you know, behavior. Um, so it's all very, it's all very pragmatic. It's all very possible. And if my dogs do not shut up every time I post it, every time I record this, there's nothing out there, y'all. There's literally nothing out there. Shut up. So it happens all the time. It happens all the time um can't can't win for losing but anyway the if it's if it's practical and it works then just go with it and if you come across something that doesn't feel right and you need to tweak it you need to adjust it that's okay too it's all about the learning it's all about the the growth of it so this is going to be a relatively short episode um because i don't want to beat this one to death i don't want to beat you know i don't want to beat a dead horse here um, and the last video was probably even shorter than this one. Uh, the first one, that is the, the original how to do a basic healing ritual. But uh, hopefully between the two videos, you know, if you want to go back and forth and kind of compare, um, you'll see, obviously, that the production is, is way different. Um, but the information, I think, is going to be slightly modified, too. There's going to be, again, some things that you, if you go back and watch that first one, you're going to be... Right. Oh, yeah. You know, that's what he said that already, you know, um, but there's also going to be some things that I think um, reflect my views on the world now that were maybe not quite as refined or defined back then. You know, I was I was still um, I was I was solid. I was, it was like, you know, not having any sort of like crisis of faith or anything like that back then. But I was I was gathering and learning so much of things myself and sharing them as I went. Um, where I've kind of hit a more, this is where I'm at with things, and this is what I can definitively say and, and be comfortable in. So um, before we conduct or conclude today's video, I do just want to let everybody know, thank you for com coming along with me uh, this far on this video, by the way, and on this episode, really appreciate it. Um, but one more thing I want to say before we uh, sign off here today is um, uh, next month, September 10th, um, myself and uh, Greg Strong, who's chieftain of the Raven Moon Hearth Kindred in Nashville, uh, we will be co-hosting an event um, here in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, at the General Bragg Trailhead uh, Pavilion. It's going to be a class on heathenry. We're calling it an introduction to heathenry. So, like heathenry 101. But he's going to, you know, him and I are going to be uh, talking a lot about, you know, some of our recommended reading material. Um, introduction to the gods and goddesses that are pretty popular in, in Germanic heathenry and um, talking about like heathen ritual and bloat and 
um, all kinds of things. There's just stuff to really hopefully help bring people that are in the area that maybe want to learn more about heathenry and see what it's about to come out here um, and just have good conversation. You know, yes, it's a class type sort of thing, but we want to have good times with people. And we want folks that are willing to learn and want to help share their knowledge come out as well. So um, there will be an event link for that in the description and show notes of this podcast as well. So it's a, it's a Facebook page, you know, event. Um, but if you're not on social media, it's going to be uh, September 10th at the General Bragg Trailhead in Murfreesboro. Um, we'll be there from three o'clock in the afternoon until the trailhead closes, which is like eight o'clock, I think, in the evening. Um, so we'll be there all afternoon starting at 3 p.m. It's a Sunday afternoon. Um, there's a playground there for kids. There's restrooms right there. The pavilion's covered. So rain or shine, we will be there. Um, feel free to bring, you know, non-alcoholic beverages and snacks if you want to come out and, and just hang out with us for the day. Uh, we will be there. We would love to see you too. All are welcome. Family friendly. Bring them all. Bring the whole, uh, as my grandmother used to say, bring the whole fam family out here. So um, that's all for today's episode. I hope you all enjoyed it. If you did, be sure to give this video a thumbs up. Follow the podcast on whatever platform that you're capturing this on. Um, and thank you all again so much for your continued and great support. Uh, check the link tree in, in the description uh, and show notes of this episode for all the ways you can support this podcast. Until we talk to each other again, may the gods continue to notice you and may your ancestors smile upon you.